that is going on, uh, I want to say uh, I always knew that it's a hard act to follow uh, Simon, uh, but I must say I didn't expect it to be that hard. <laughs> <laughs> so you are in for a big disappointment, a big drop in uh, whatever it is that uh, you experienced before. Um, anyway, so I, I want to uh, uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. Um, this is the first opportunity for me to participate in this uh, a religion science dialogue at that level. Uh, so far I only participated in uh, the parish level where I gave talks on science and so on in my uh, church. Um, so uh, what I would like to do here is to uh, reflect upon how scientists uh, can make or facilitate the dialogue between religion and, and uh and science uh, in a way that you know may make it more um, uh, uh, effective than it is uh, it, than it often is. Um, so, um, so as I said, this is my first uh, uh, foray in this area, and uh, you know I apologize if I uh, uh, bore you with uh, with things that you all know already since decades. But anyway, it's as an as a way of introduction, one has to. <coughs> Uh, ask oneself, so how is it possible to find a, a way to a, a dialogue that can actually be uh, productive? And I, I'm struck by uh, one idea that uh, Cardinal Sch uh, Christoph Schönborn has uh, <coughs> proposed uh, in a, a talk he gave at the European uh, Forum in Altbach uh, a few years ago, uh, where he said that you know what needs to be uh, there is we need to revive the area of philosophy of nature, nature philosophy. Uh, as a sort of neutral uh, meeting ground between uh, science and, uh, and religion. In that way, if uh, we can bring our own perspectives into a third area, the philosophy of nature, then uh, we can uh, talk about ideas and, 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 and approaches without uh, directly encroaching on uh, each other's uh, territories. So I think that is a very uh, uh, interesting idea and I think uh, in order to make this work, you know, we often uh, have to step out of our technical context and the way we do this is we uh, take our uh, scientific advances and our insights, transform them into metaphors in order to make them uh, uh, communicable uh, at the level of the philosophy of nature. So, but <coughs> in order to do, make this uh, work, I think there are some common sense ground rules we all should uh, uh, observe. The one is, I would ask uh, theologians not to tell scientists how to do science. Uh, I think that is uh, one thing that will never uh, lead to a fruitful uh, conversations if we violate this. Unfortunately, uh, that is not always uh, observed. Uh, and now I'm quoting uh, Schönborn again. And here I disagree with him uh, when he said, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, talking about evolution, uh, and says any systems of thought that denies or seeks to explain away the overwhelming evidence for design and biology is ideology, not science. And the main problem here is that you know, a non-scientist tells me what science is and how science is to be done. And uh, that, of course, is not a good way uh, moving forward. But on the other hand, I think it's also important that we as scientists uh, don't tell uh, theologians or for that matter any person of faith uh, what their religion is about, right? I mean, we heard on the first evening there is a possibility to do a natural history of religion without being offensive, but uh, there are other ways of doing it that are, in my opinion, not really uh, 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 productive, like in the case of Richard Dawkins, who unfortunately is often seen as a spokesperson for science, even though I may point, want to point out that Dawkins haven't hasn't published a scientific paper for about three decades. Uh, so even though he was uh, a uh, quite influential and good uh, evolutionary uh, behavioral, e e ecological uh, behavioralist, uh, he isn't anymore, right? So I, I don't think you should take any of these uh, uh, ideas as a uh, direct uh, uh, statement of scientific uh, um, value. And then, of course, for both uh, sides, uh, an important uh, uh, idea is intellectual honesty. And I think it is uh, this that I want to talk about, in particular about the intellectual honesty that we should, uh, as scientists, uh, should uh, <coughs> uh, adhere to when we uh, you know, 
talk about science, uh, about uh, um, life and organisms and uh, bring metaphors to the greater public and to uh, a conversation with, uh, with religion. So <clears throat> the, the issue that I uh, want to discuss from a biological point of view is that uh, when we, very often when you hear uh, biologists talk about how sort of the generalized ideas about uh, how life works and so on. They use metaphors, and very often these metaphors are almost designed to be offensive. They are, uh, in a way, uh, 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 denigrating the dignity of, 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 of life, including uh, humans by implication, in a way to, uh, that uh, can be best uh, encapsulated by the German word Verdinglichung, and I haven't found any uh, English translation for it. It essentially means you take a living thing as a thing to objectify it, commodify it, or whatever, right? And, um, and it's also, in my opinion, the case that many of these uh, metaphors that we hear out of this uh, corner are uh, supporting an attitude of disrespect for life and living organisms. And uh, what I mean by that, I will explain a little bit. So uh, maybe the most extreme uh, form that you can hear, sort of the most um, uh, uh, redu reductionist and uh, mater materialist uh, idea is that to say, well, we understand organisms now at the level of molecules, so anything that happens in a body is sort of biochemistry in one form or the other. Um, you know, it's uh, physical chemistry playing out in our bodies, so in essentially, organisms are a bag of molecules only governed by the laws of physical chemistry. <clears throat> the second one is a little bit more subtle, and I will have to explain more you know, where this is coming from and what, what's at stake here. That is actually a more uh, recent uh, discussion, even within uh, biology, uh, the question of you know, what uh, a species really is, whether it just resides in a, the set of cis-regulatory elements in its genome. And that is actually something you can find in a book of Eric Davidson, one of the leaders of uh, developmental uh, genetics. So I will propose that neither of these positions is uh, uh, supported by scientific fact. And uh, if we are intellectually honest, we have to get rid of these uh, 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 metaphors and uh, present uh, in uh, a discussion of what life is a much more nuanced view. And it will also connect uh, uh, to what uh, uh, Simon said uh, earlier today, uh, this morning, uh, to, you know, to sort of the missing dimensions of, of, uh, of, of Darwinism. So let's first go to this uh, first idea that is easily uh, dispatched with, and with the idea that organisms are nothing else but a bag of, uh, of, of molecules. And you can actually uh, easily uh, test this in a Gedanken experiment, uh, in a thought experiment, and ask whether that can actually be true. So let's take an organism like a cat here, right? Uh, has all these molecules in there. And if we assume it's just a bag of organisms, nothing else matters about that cat, so we can test this by uh, getting a, a blender, <laughs> take the cat in there, then right? so it shouldn't matter, right? Because if it's just a, a bag of molecules, you know, the molecules that happened here will also be in the blender. And, uh, you know, nothing, nothing substantial should have happened, right? But we all know the result will be a bloody mess. And, uh, and uh, probably the most likely outcome is uh, death on the uh, uh, fields of science. Uh, and so we can discuss what exactly is uh, an organism is in addition to a bag of, of molecules, which we of course are to some extent, but it cannot be all of it. Uh, but as long as we agree that that's the case, we can then ask in what way are living organisms more than a bag of, 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 uh, of molecules. Um, various answers to that. I'm not going to offer one uh, today, but I just want to open up that many of these, you know, uh, sort of stark uh, metaphors are you know, simple uh, nonsense, in my opinion. Okay. Now, the second one is a little bit more subtle, and it will take me more time to explain what's uh, behind this, is, uh, um, uh, uh, but the bottom line is the following. <coughs> what's at stake is, is the claim that uh, we can conceptualize a real organism like this fox here as, uh, as sort of an arrangement of elements that are replaceable elements, like a Lego figure, right? So uh, like Lego figures, uh, Lego pieces are uh, very nice because it can be universally uh, you know, 
combine to each other. And so the idea is that <coughs> organisms are made out of this uh, uh, replaceable uh, equivalent, functional equivalent units. And in a way, the different forms of organisms are just different arrangements of the same things. Fundamentally, they are all the same, right? That's sort of the ideological uh, uh, consequence of it. Now, the origin, of course, this type of thinking is not without scientific basis. And it's in, uh, important to understand where it's coming from and, in, and uh, to understand at what point this uh, metaphor is breaking down and what uh, uh, consequences that might have. So the one uh, origin of this Lego theory of life is the discovery of conserved developmental genes, which was a huge advance in, in biology, where it was found that <coughs> certain genes that are essential for making a fly body are also found um, in, the, in, in mammals, here in the mouse, and they also have roughly uh, similar functions in, uh, um, in patterning the, the body axis. So that was interesting because they're highly conserved molecular uh, domains that make them uh, uh, clearly uh, homologous um, things. And what they are, actually, and I apologize for the low quality of this uh, 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 slide here, uh, what they are are proteins, so these genes code for proteins. The proteins are called transcription factors. The transcription factors are proteins that bind to DNA and uh, then determine whether a particular gene is either expressed or not. So they're the regulatory molecules in the, in, 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 in the body. <coughs> and, uh, and so the idea was that these uh, transcription factors uh, are highly conserved and they are the same all over uh, uh, the, the metasome or all over uh, uh, animals, uh, uh, the animal kingdom, which led to this idea of a genetic toolkit that all that you know have different, the same types of uh, uh, tools. You know, those are sort of metaphorically the different uh, transcription factors, uh, regulatory molecules, and you can make different products from it by simply using the same uh, tools in uh, different ways to get a chair or a stool, or in the same way you know you get a fly or. A, uh, a, a mouse simply by using the same tools, but use them in different temporal and spatial uh, pa uh, pattern. Now that uh, view was also supported by some experimental evidence that was actually quite surprising. Uh, here a, a paper by McGuinness in uh, 1990, where they could show that a human protein can replace in some respects the function of a fly protein. And the thing that they were looking at is there's a uh, one of these uh, homeobox genes is called uh, deformed, and this deformed is able to uh, uh, regulate itself positively. And it, uh, uh, what they showed in this experiment is that they can turn on the fly deformed gene by overexpressing the uh, mouse or human uh, corresponding gene, which is at that time was called, uh, it's now is called Hox D4. So that is very surprising, but very, very interesting that you know, so distantly related uh, species, the proteins can actually uh, substitute for each other. And that was uh, generalized to this idea that we all consist of, the, of replaceable units and you know, are basically different arrangements of the same things. But it turns out that uh, if you look into more experimental evidence that this is not generally uh, the case and that it was the first time uh, shown uh, in a comparison of two corresponding genes, Tinman and NKX 2.5. Tinman is a gene that's necessary for heart development. So if you mutate it, you get a fly without a heart, therefore Tinman. And NKX 2.5 is the boring name it has in vertebrates. And here is uh, what, uh, um, how that works. All of these blobs here are fly embryos. These dark stains here are uh, in situ hybridizations to tell you where a particular gene that are listed here are expressed in this uh, embryo. And here you see the wild type. And here you see the mutant of uh, uh, tin man mut uh, mutant. So certain genes expression patterns are lost. And you can rescue it by giving it the tin man gene uh, back. Uh, so this is the typical experiment. Uh, a rescue experiment, you get all the expression patterns back like in the, in the, in the, in, in the wild type. But if you do uh, the same experiment with uh, the human gene, NKX 2.5, you get this expression pattern back, but you don't get any of those. So this was the first experimental hint that even though in some respects 
genes from different or proteins from different uh, organisms can replace each other, they are usually not universally replacing each other in all uh, uh, functionally important respects. So uh, another example from our own research uh, where we found the same thing uh, that has to do with the cells with the uterine lining, that's the endometrium. In particular, we are interested in the cells that are making up the, the ground substance here that is called the stroma. And that's a particularly interesting cell type because it is the cell type that negotiates uh, the truth between the mother and the fetus because the fetus is uh, digging into the maternal tissue and needs to be sort of tamed in a way. And all of this uh, uh, work is done by the endometrial stromal cells. And uh, there's also a gene that we uh, worked about, uh, HOXA11, which has been shown to be important for the development of these uh, 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 cells. So if you have a, a mouse without a HOXA11, the female, the uterus is smaller. Here's the wild type uterus. Here's a cross section of the wild type. All of those are endometrial stromal cells in the wild type. In the, without that gene, these cells go away, and these uh, uh, females are sterile because they have a non-functioning uh, uterus. So we were really interested in this uh, uh, gene. And so here's a very early experiment that in, in hindsight turned out to be, you know, uh, giving us the direction of a lot of future research. So we, uh, uh, we looked at the expression of a number of genes that are known to be important in endometrial stromal cells and, uh, and could show if we knock down HOXA11 in these cells, those are human cells, you lose expression of two of them. The one is called prolactin, the other one is uh, uh, TGF-beta. You can rescue it again with the mouse gene, so uh, the we, we get both of them back, but if you try to res rescue it with the chicken protein, it turns out we get back the TGF-beta but not prolactin. So what was from our, in our lab the first hint that you know, also HOXA11 is not uh, you know, functionally equivalent. So what? So why, why is this interesting um, uh, for a, in a broader sense? Um, so there are a number of questions that, that follow from you. What does this tell us about the, uh, how genes conspire or work together to make an organism? What does it tell us about the nature of life in the organism? So that's what I want to sort of briefly re reflect about. So the question is why and in what way uh, do these proteins change their ability to uh, to act in a particular uh, context. And, uh, and here's uh, something that we call our Lazarus experiment. I don't need to explain this here, what that means. Uh, it's essentially a type of experiments where we uh, you know, computationally reconstruct the ancestral proteins and then physically realize that proteins basically resurrect an extinct protein and then do biochemistry with these proteins in the lab. Uh, therefore, we call it the Lazarus experiment. So here is HOXA11 in case you don't recognize it, and this is uh, Vincent Lynch in my lab who is pulling out HOXA11 from its grave. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, the important thing here is that what uh, these experiments show is that uh, uh, only mammalian proteins can functionally cooperate in regulating, let's say, uh, prolactin. And this is a cooperation this is not a property of the, of the, of the uh, 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 protein itself, but it is a ability to cooperate with another protein that's called FOXO1A. And what you see here is that, you know, this is, I can explain to you, this is just an essay of gene expression. If you, uh, HOXA11 is inhibiting gene expression, FOXO is doing nothing uh, by, on its own. If you put them in together, they together can upregulate the, the target gene. And that's true for the human, the mouse, and the uh, ancestrally reconstructed proteins. But uh, uh, proteins that are outside the the, the placental mammals cannot do that, opossum, chicken, and the uh, phylogenetic re reconstructors. So the main thing here, when, uh, of when we see functional non-equivalence, that's an indication that uh, only certain proteins, proteins that are found in some organisms, can functionally cooperate to do a particular task. It's not an intrinsic property of the, of the, of the, of the HOXA11 or any of these proteins that we are uh, looking at it is all about uh, communication between molecules. Okay. So, and the the main thing is regulatory proteins, at least in higher organisms, don't act alone. They always form groups, and the actual unit of function that we are sort of observing the consequences of are always uh, 
um, uh, complexes or groups of proteins that work together in order to, to produce a particular outcome. So now I'd, I want to get a step back and don't want to uh, uh, bore you with even more technical uh, results. I just want to very briefly summarize what I think is a, a very long story and, and the way how we uh, started to understand the uh, role of proteins and how they uh, evolve. Uh, so the one thing is, as I already said, transcription factors work by cooperating with other transcription factors and proteins to get us an organism. Um, and, uh, and the way they do it is that transcription factors react to the presence of other proteins by choosing alternative, among alternative biochemical behaviors. So a, a protein is not intrinsically the one thing or the other. It only acts in a certain way in a particular context. So they have cho choices of doing, you know, being an inhibitor or binding or phosphorylating or whatever. And what they are actually doing, they have this whole repertoire, they have a repertoire of sort of biochemical behavior. And what they are doing is they sense who else is there and with whom together I show a particular behavior, right? And, uh, and, uh, and that's the reason why different organisms consist of proteins that have certain ways of talking to each other. That's the reason they are not replaceable across uh, different types of organisms. They are uh, deeply integrated into their community of molecules. To and, and, uh, and the reason why they are not generally rep uh, replaceable with each other is because their function itself is actually sort of a social thing that they are doing. So you can uh, actually think about transcription factors and other proteins, uh, better conceptualize them as agents rather than passive molecules. And, um, and I will... Uh, 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 say a little bit what I mean by that. So if you take and uh, think about an animal uh, that has uh, that shows behavior, the simplest way of conceptualizing is you have sensory functions, you have some information processing, brains or whatever, and then some motor activities that are controlled by the transformation of the sensory uh, uh, function through information processing into motor activity, which then feeds back to sensory function. Now I think what we found over the years is that uh, the same structural organization we find even re realized within one protein. And the thing is that in the proteins, these regulatory proteins, have surfaces that are, act like sensory functions, like ligand and cofactor binding uh, domains, which then influence intramolecular regulation, the way how they fold and how, which parts of the molecule are available to, for function, and then among the possible uh, biochemical activities, some of them which are selected depending on how the intramolecular regulation happens. So it's uh, structurally entirely uh, 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 the same as, a, as an agent. And the main thing that I think our lab has contributed was to find that the most majority of evolutionary changes actually happen here. There's some evolution down here where new biochemical capabilities actually arise, DNA binding, you know, enzymatic activities, but most of evolutionary changes in these areas where the proteins um, evolve to be able to communicate and cooperate with other sets of molecules that they haven't done so in the past, okay? So my conclusion is that uh, functional cooperation of uh, uh, molecules has more in common with the social interaction networks than uh, uh, among animals than with passive molecular reactivity, the way we usually think about when we say, you know, what are molecules doing? Um, so organisms are made of, of uniquely co-adapted molecules that are neither just collections of molecules nor are they combinations of replaceable units. They are usually highly integrated in, uh, uh, and uh, um, interdependent uh, 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 and, um, uh, entities, and uh, so the nature of organisms cannot be sub subsumed under a general uh, overarching theory. We still can understand them scientifically, but each on their own terms, because each of them sort of produces a unique set of, uh, 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 of, of forms of interaction that are, you know, cannot be uh, subsumed under a, a, a general uh, theory. And I would say that, you know, the philosophical uh, consequences of which we may want to discuss in the next, and I thank you for your attention, and I hope I wasn't too far. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Gunter. And I think you've distilled a huge amount of information in a very complex area. It's very lucid. So thank you very much. Um, just if there are any technical questions, because the slides are on the, sc uh, the screen still, if uh, we need to refer to them. Uh, I was, this is Jack Templeton. I was very impressed with uh, some of the slides, as Gunter did, about the issue of intellectual honesty and humility. About a year and a half ago, we had an advisor's meeting for the John Templeton Foundation. And in discussing humility, I tried to take them back through eons of time. It's, it's a mixed uh, group of people who are advisors, some of which would have the strengths that are represented here in this room. So I said, is the average child who is born today have the same intellectual potentiality as the child born 2,000 years ago? 25% said uh, no, they were uh, smarter. Then I took it back to the pyramids. This is the average, they said no, 50% said no, we're smarter than the pyramids. Then I sort of took it back like 10,000 years ago, and if that's an approximation, the start of agricultural societies, and another 25%, that now means 75% said we are clearly smarter. But from that point on, when I took it back to perhaps some other earmark in human development, the 25% said maybe those 25 and 30,000 years ago were just as smart, which then fits my thought experiment, which is space travel or time travel, that we would go back 25 or 30,000 years ago, and we would plan to stay there for two or three weeks, get the trust of people living in a cave, and this is inspired, if you've ever seen pictures of people who go into Latin America and the favelas and the slums, some others walk out and give you their baby and said, my child has no hope here. Will you take this child back to America? So I envisioned three cave women with kids who are five and six months old said, we don't understand it. We can barely communicate. We know that you're leaving. We know you must be going back to something extraordinary. Will you take our three babies? And then the question, more than a hypothesis, when those kids arrive, get adopted, and then go through schooling, might one end up as a successful plumber, one as a successful graduate of a community college, and one as a graduate of an honors college? Who can say? But um, the thing that got me onto that also is that nobody can figure out the pigments in the, in the uh, pyramids. I mean, they, they understand a lot more things. Actually, I understand they can't understand the pigments in the cathedral at Chartres. So I just opened that as a question of, because I think I heard sort of a suggestion that we have been evolving in our intellectual capacity. So that's a counterpoint. Um, I, I think there's something uh, 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 tempting in, in, in thinking that way. But uh, personally, I think the uh, level of cleverness that we have achieved is a social uh, fact and not a biological fact. Uh, and so my argument is that that's probably not true because if you're really dumb, you wouldn't survive as a caveman and, uh, and, and, and not as a hunter. Anyone who has tried to hunt it knows it takes a lot of intellect to actually find an animal, in particular if you don't have a rifle, <laughs> but you know, want to actually kill it with a spear. Uh, so I, I, can, I, I have a hard time actually making sense of, of the ideas that, you know, we are, you know, I, if anything, on average, I think the, 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 the plausibility is more that we are less intelligent today because we are less selected for actually survival, right? So, I mean, if there's any, any, any indication on average, I think we should become less intelligent. Uh, although, you know, because we are so many, the tales will, will be more extreme than, you know, if you have only, you know, 1% uh, of us in numbers. Uh, so um, so I, 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 I think it's just implausible. I think Janet, oh, who has the microphone? That's the power, isn't it? <laughs> um, can I just ask you for the sake of the people watching the video, just to give your name and your affiliate? Yes, my name is Klaus Tanner. I'm from the University of Heidelberg, colleague of Michael Welke here. Thanks for your talk. And uh, coming back to the question of metaphors uh, uh, you had in your topic, uh, 
would you then also say that uh, the picture we all have in mind of the DNA, the, like Watson and Crick uh, presented it, uh, is very misleading because it's also Lego theory. That's one, the, one and the second question is, uh, going back to your last slides, you also used the metaphorical language, cooperation, sure. behavior, choose, right. you had it in bracket. So my question is, is there really an alternative uh, uh, is it uh, to, to metaphorical language uh, or I, not? I, 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 I don't think we have an alternative. If we want to communicate beyond our narrow uh, technical specialties, we, we have to resort to, to metaphors in, in one way or the other. Otherwise, we, I think I, I, I wouldn't know another way to communicate you know, uh, outside my, you know, uh, outside my uh, narrow uh, specialty uh, because it is so technical. Right, a lot of it, and I think the implications are always met metaphorical in, in a way. Um, so I, I'm not against the use of metaphors. What I'm against is, is uh, metaphors that are not reflecting reality, and that uh, you know, yeah, right. So at, at least not. Yeah, so at least don't give us metaphors that are manifestly not uh, 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 in in in. in concert with, with, with scientific fact, like, you know, the idea of, you know, we are a bag of molecules, or, you know, or the idea everything is in the DNA and things like that. So coming back to the DNA, um, right, I mean, DNA, the idea of a DNA at the chemical <laughs> level is certainly true. I think, I think that's not something to, uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to, to, to doubt. Um, but what we can discuss, and which is uh, an open question, is to what degree uh, uh, DNA determines the outcome of development and, and, and what, uh, what it contributes to, uh, to what organisms are, right? I mean, at, at one level, at the causal level, uh, DNAs don't make organisms. If you have a naked DNA, it can't do anything. It's chemically inert. So clearly, you know, from the very beginning, uh, you know, an egg cell uh, is what you need and not a DNA. You, you need DNA in a cell and the cell in machinery. And so therefore, you know, the whole causality doesn't flow uh, alone from, from, the, from the DNA. It's an interaction between DNA and, and everything else around it. Um, and I think, you know, if we, if we want to have an honest uh, dialogue, uh, I think all we scientists also need to be very uh, uh, precise and, and, and honest in, in what it actually means, what we know. And, uh, and, and I want this to be reflected in the metaphors we use when we talk outside our specialty. Okay, so... Janet, and then um, you, and then Andrew, and you. So I've got you, sorry, and then uh, um, Jeff at the back. Thank you. University of Cambridge, and I wrote a book about metaphor and science and religion, so I'm very delighted by the session. One, and, and my question was partly that which has just been answered, but also I was very struck the connection between the two papers was on language and communication. Uh, um, that Simon mentioned that, talking about the Owen, Owen Barfield and the origins of language. And granted, we have to use metaphorical language, but nonetheless, it does seem to represent a shift away from this m physicalist bags of molecules thing towards the idea that the fundamental connective tissue of the universe might be communication. And I think this is something that applies outside the biological sciences. And it's certainly something that applies in theology because, um, well, if you, you make the intermediate step that, that the world isn't full of Newtonian billiard balls, but full of mm -hmm. energy and you know, quarks and charm and things like that, other metaphors. But within theology, this goes back to ancient Jewish and Christian ideas about the world being made by the word or the world being held together by love, by some kind of energy. So I think it's, a, it's a very interesting and productive and interesting that both of you, I, I, I think, seem genuinely to want to stress communication as being central to understanding biological process. Yep. Simon? Yep, well, I thank you for the comment. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that's, the, that's sort of the gist of what I wanted to convey. I mean, that, I mean we can be scientifically rigorous, and if we are very attentive to the details of our experimental work, it actually leads to a way of looking at things that are, you know, much more uh, compatible with, with the things that you said. You know, they're not in the same language. They don't mean in detail that well, but it's closer than a lot of materialistic accounts. And I'm, you know, I'm, 
<laughs> I'm a physical scientist, right? I'm not against uh, mechanistic explanations, and you know, I'm doing, you know, hardcore, you know, molecular biology in in the lab. So it's not against that. I think, uh, but still, even you know, uh, uh, you know, hardcore physics, you know, will lead us to a way of uh, a much more nuanced view of of the world than uh, than sort of the 19th century steam engine type of of materialism, right? Yeah, because I think it's very clear that cells, if you just take cells, they have to communicate and respond to each other in order to create a functioning organism. So communication and being able to respond to the environment and <coughs> signals from other things, small molecules, I mean, it's all communication, even at the cellular level. So I think it's a very helpful move that biology's become less mechanistic. Could I just, I don't want to divert because the questions are more important, but I was struck very much by uh, Gunter's talk. Um, what, one of the things, for instance, in cell communication is it rather looks as if um, the original function of collagen was for cell communication long, long before it was used as a structural molecule to allow you and me to stand up. So it's a nice example of co-option. The other one, which I was very struck when Gunter was talking, was with regard, I think it's papers by Bialik on the nature of the immune system. And again, he refers to this as a language. And effectively, what's so fascinating is that the development of the brain and the immune system have one thing in common. They've got to make up their mind, metaphorically speaking, extremely quickly. You can't, you can't dither around when you've got bubonic plague. Um, and in either case, what, it, what happens is that, in fact, some of the molecules are used in the, same, in, in the different contexts to do basically the same thing, decide whether a neuron attaches or doesn't, or whether an axon extends or doesn't, or whether, in fact, you generate the antigen or not. So again, there's deep commonalities here, and as you say, it's basically everybody is talking to everybody else. And I think, I mean, in fairness to Richard Dawkins, I think it, it, he's made many important contributions. I mean, one is, as we look at the sort of world around us, though we're deaf to it by and large until we use the right equipment, there's a roar of communication. All those plants out there are all busy shouting at one another. They use chemicals, but they're in, they're in very vigorous communication. Okay. Actually, we're, we're, I know we started late, but we're actually running very short of time. So could we maybe just um, have the questions? Um. I have a question. Uh, there's always a group of proteins and uh, transcript effectors. Do you have any speculations on the minimum conditions to form such a group? Or are there also speculations on minimum conditions to constitute an organism? Quick answers, no. no, no, no. <laughs> Do you agree? He, he's right. <laughs> Andrew, no, yeah, Andrew's the go. next. Sorry, I have a list. <laughs> Drew Briggs from uh, Oxford University. And I, w I wanted to pick up on Dr. Templeton's uh, point and ask whether in this realm of, of the sophisticated human thought and culture and so on, there are limits to convergence, and are there aspects of human endeavor and being that go beyond convergence? And I suppose you could say that in terms of our sensory organs, you know, we've pretty well hit the limits, and indeed there are some animals that have some sensory organs that are better than ours and more sensitive. But uh, animals don't build libraries, and they don't build computers, and they don't solve, prove Thermat's last theorem and so on. Is your sense that they are going to converge on that and we'll see other species doing that? Or have we, as a human species, are we distinct in that specific respect in a way that goes beyond convergence? Um, it, it, it's, very, it's a very interesting question. I've been thinking about this quite a lot. Um, very, very quickly, what I, I think is that, um, t to begin with, now that we're here, all bets are off. The fact that we got here can be regarded historically as an accident. I don't think it was, but that's another story. But I think the other tension, which is as interesting, it sort of came out in a couple of the talks yesterday, is to the extent to which you see the world as a process of emergence, which self-evidently it is, but also <coughs> the sense in which it's involved with discovery of pre-existent realities. So in that sense, the building of the libraries, of course, is the way we encode our information. And now, of course, we're moving to another stage, which we wouldn't have thought of 20 years ago. Um, and we don't really know where that's going to end. So I know that's, that's in, I think, the sense, this sort of sense of the precipice we're on at the moment. But uh, yes, I think anybody can do it. 
because of course we all share the same biology. Although, as I'm going to say, you know, we are all unique as well. Thank you. Uh, the, this um, a comment and a question. The comment is that uh, the Robert Frost said all metaphors are imperfect, and that's the beauty of them. Um, the question is for Simon, and it relates to the previous question. So we, we have a situation where there are a billion petri dishes, geochemical situations in the Milky Way, where life could have emerged if it if that is a proclivity towards it, and we also have t enough cosmic time where you could have an Earth clone with a six billion year head start on us, already out there, running the experiment forward. Now since um, from convergent arguments, so it's not a weather vane spinning <coughs> idly, it doesn't have necessarily a fixed direction, if you were going to predict the future us, or post us, or alternative uses, where us is broadly defined, what would you say? Gosh, well, uh, I mean, uh, th 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 there are many elements to that, and you know, like you, Chris, I've been thinking about this a great deal. Um, I mean, qu most likely, though, I don't know how it's going to pan out, is that that experiment is done, and that's why we haven't detected we ha SETI hasn't worked because we're simply asking the wrong thing to the wrong place. Uh, if they're there, they're probably in a way which is unrecognisable. The reverse of that, of course, is a proposal which was touched on briefly yesterday as to just how likely is the origin of life. And David Bartholomew, I believe, has argued that, in fact, you can look at it as being statistically fantastically improbable unless you just so happen to have a universe of roughly our size. And he also goes on to point out, as a statistician, that if that is the case, then it would be most unlikely to only evolve once. It'd probably be two or three times. Can we end there? Two, there are just two more questions. Jeff at the back. <coughs> one here. Uh, Jeff Schloss from the Center for Philosophy, Faith, and Life Sciences in Santa Barbara. Thank you both very much for stimulating conversation. Uh, I have a, a, a comment on um, a point that, that Professor Wagner made at the beginning of his talk, which actually um, probably isn't central to your talk, but I think is an important point. It involved your comment about Schoenberg's statement that uh, folks from without the sciences shouldn't be telling scientists how to do their job, and I agree with that. But it seems to me that he may, might have been trying to do something else um, and been doing it very imperfectly. And that is not so much trying to tell scientists how they're do, to do their job, but as somebody uh, with philosophical training saying something like this, um, you're describing how you're attempting to do your job. You're describing the methodology you use and the epistemological commitments. And given what you say science is, there are certain kinds of conclusions that you can't reach as science. And if you do reach them, you're doing something other than science. And it seems to me the problem with the Schoenberg uh, criticism was, was not that he was um, suggesting that science can't conclude there's no design or ultimate intentionality to the cosmos, but that his notion of a design involved an interventionist uh, perspective and the, the necessity of the failure of naturalistic explanation rather than, as John Polkinghorne was suggesting yesterday, there might be multiple levels of explanation. Thank you very much. I think we'll continue that in the coffee break. Just perhaps you could ask a question, then we should break. A very quick question for uh, uh, Simon. So you offered a couple of really interesting examples, anecdotal examples of individuals whose consciousness seemed to transcend uh, time. Um, there's also those examples where consciousness seems to transcend space, the idea of non-local minds. So 70% of Americans, for example, re report things like, I was out in California, I was in an accident, and I really thought the end was there for my life. And lo and behold, 10 minutes later, I was OK. But my mother called from New York, where the time difference is three hours. So 70% of Americans report examples of non-local mindedness. Why don't we take those examples more seriously when we think about the nature of mind? And what do you think about them? 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think my, I'm, 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 I'm silly interested in this area. Uh, and it's another uh, example of how to engage in you know, first-class uh, academic suicide. Yeah. Fine. But <laughs> for, for me, it doesn't matter. Right. Me um, but I do agree with you. I think, in fact, 
there are, there, there's an enormous amount of information there. And if we're a scientist, we can actually begin to see some common patterns. Uh, and I, I think some quite interesting things might come out of it. But I think, on the other hand, we should realise what we're beginning to play with. Right, so that's a very good note on which to stop. And uh, thank you all very much for contributing.